The American Geophysical Union is a robust global network of scientists working across disciplines in Earth and space science. And the fall meeting is the most influential event in the world dedicated to the advancement of Earth and space sciences. This year, for the first time ever, Chicago is welcoming more than 25,000 attendees from more than 100 countries to come together to share research and network. Researchers, scientists, educators, policymakers, and journalists will converge to communicate about ways to better understand our planet and our role in preserving its future. AGU TV will be there for four jam packed days, highlighting keynote sessions, speaking with influential policymakers, spotlighting universities and organizations from all across the world, and bringing you in depth sit down interviews from those at the forefront of Earth and space science. There will be something for everyone, and we want to make sure you don't miss a minute. You will be able to find all the latest episodes and content of AGU TV on the in house channels of our partner hotels. On our dedicated page on the AGU website, and of course, always on our Twitter and YouTube channels. Plenty of ways to watch. Now to welcome you to the AGU Fall Meeting. We are joined this morning by Randy Fizer, CEO of AGU. Thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you for having me. This Absolutely. is great. All right, let's dive right in. So sure. this year's theme is Science Leads the Future. What does that mean to you? So to me, Science Leads the Future is really about how the information that our scientists gather and, and study is really important to how we make decisions about where we go in the future. I mean, look at the, the issues that we're dealing with in the society, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, we have other types of societal challenges that we're dealing with, um, environmental justice issues, uh, sea level rise. All of those things are just, you know, things that we are facing in the future and lots and lots of decisions need to be made around that. So how do we make sure that science stays at the forefront when it comes to tackling some of those problems? You know, I think that's a great question because it's really important that scientists learn to communicate um, their science to the general population. Um, we need to do it not as scare tactics and get people freaked out that, oh my God, the world is ending, but do it in a way that really shows that um, one, we can convey the information that makes it understandable, um, makes it actionable, um, and really touches in people's values and how they believe the world is um, structured and what they care about. You touched on this just a moment ago, but you know the word future, we would like to think, expresses um, hope and optimism, but I don't have to tell you that certainly in this atmosphere these days, um, sometimes it can also elicit feelings of fear mm -hmm. and um, you know uncertainty. How can science keep it positive? Yeah, it's a, a great question as well. Um, you know the thinking about a sustainable future and really painting the picture that if we do the right things as a planet and we do the right things as people on this planet, that we really can actually create a future that everybody is going to be excited about, um, that we are gonna be happy that our grandchildren can live in, um, and that we can really um, do the right thing as a, as a planet and, and create this environment that we know is, we are capable of doing. Um, so I think always, you know, putting out the challenges because we got to let people know what we're facing, but doing it in a way that says, but if we do that, this is what the future could look like for us. Well, the fall meeting this week is yeah. a great opportunity for researchers and scientists to exchange those messages. What are you looking forward to in the week ahead? Well, one is just seeing everybody. I, I think it's <laughs> always, always great to bring this community together. Um, and with the, you know, we're looking at about 23,000 people being here. Um, and uh, we think 80% of them are going to be in person. We are gonna be looking at um, areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as, a, as a community, um, environmental justice. Um, we're also looking at climate interventions um, that are taking place and really how can we um, address some of the challenges that are gonna be faced with that. Um, uh, so it's just really incredible when this group gets together and how much um, knowledge and information is shared in one place. You mentioned some of the new initiatives that AGU will be embarking on for this yeah. year's meeting. Any one in particular that you are most looking forward to or that you think might be the most impactful? I think there's a really important effort that AGU started on um, this last year, um, and that is exploring an ethical framework for climate intervention. Um, so we absolutely are, think it's critical as a 
community of, of Earth and space scientists that carbon dioxide emissions reduction takes place, point blank. We need that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, there's been a lot more evidence that the, the goals that we've set for ourselves as a, a, a planet to maintain what we need to do in order to achieve or to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius is we're not on that path and we're not on a good path. So there's been a lot of exploration going on um, in the scientific world around how do we possibly intervene in climate um, change with different tools and mechanisms that are not um, the just about emissions reduction. Um, so AGU is developing an ethical framework which is going to put a construct around the, those research initiatives to have conversations to say, is this the right thing to be even mm. doing and thinking about? And it's really, I think, a, an important part that the scientific community, along with partners, can play in the future of this planet. Very. Going back to the theme, science leads the future. What are the ingredients for success when it comes to science staying at the forefront of our future? Yeah. I think it's um, having open science um, so that the science is accessible to all. Um, and then having that translation mm -hmm. um, and ability to communicate it in a way that other it makes it understandable to everybody. Uh, and I think those things are the key ingredients, and AGU is working on both of those. All right. Well, best of luck this week. Thank you, Thank you for your time Thanks this for morning. Thanks for being here. AGU CEO Randy Pfizer. As I mentioned, this is the first time AGU attendees have called the Windy City home for the fall meeting. It's a city rich in history and hot dogs. Chicago historian Sherman Dilla Thomas takes us on a tour. Everything dope about America comes from Chicago. The first place ever to electrify the blues, right? Plugging an amplifier into a guitar and then playing the blues, that happened in Chicago, right? By definition, that also means that Chicago invented rock and roll. This is uh, sometimes an amazing spot in the summer because they do uh, um, live performances here. Um, Buddy Guy has came and performed here. Chicago, was, if you look at the map of Chicago, we were very small in the 1870s, 1880s. And then when it was announced that we were going to get the World's Fair, other small suburbs annexed themselves in. They voted to annex it to Chicago. So the castle part of White Castle is based off of the Chicago Water Tower. If you turn around, they're still using that design uh, today, right? Our architecture uh, changed the world coming out of the Great Chicago Fire, right? One, we invent the skyscraper. So if you have a building that's, you know, taller than six, seven stories in your city, that concept comes from Chicago. Uh, this is the oldest continuously owned black piece of property in Chicago. I'm just glad the building is still standing but so that the story can be told. One of the second oldest original. Still can't charge the $50,000. This is my though, so. That's, you know, that's work. Somebody's gonna have something to say. Uh, I see it's round, you know, I see it. And, you know, I know the city now. I know, I know the city really well. Uh, I'm typically a humble guy, except for when we're talking about who knows the city. Blindfold me, you, you, you're not gonna beat me. Huh? <laughs> Turning now to those at the forefront of Earth and space science exploration, all across the globe, universities, institutes, and collaborative research centers are breaking new ground. Let's see their studies in action. The weather is ever-changing. To even stand a chance against all of these uh, high-stake odds, we need to connect, and that's what CIRA does. CIRA is a cooperative institute for research in the atmosphere. Um, we are part of Colorado State University, but we are also uh, in cooperation with NOAA, and all of our work is toward NOAA's mission goals. From thunderstorms to hurricanes, from fires to floods, from heat waves to blizzards, this is a major problem that we try to address through modeling, through satellite observations, and through working with forecasters to help inform uh, them and decision makers on what to do next. We are bridging a gap between the operational forecasters and the research scientists in atmospheric science. NOAA refers to this as the weather-ready nation, being ready for anything. 
uh, we refer to it as connecting science to society. CoWork is a large consortium that involves universities, national laboratories, water utilities, and nonprofit and for profit organizations in the US and Israel. We are seeking solutions that can satisfy both water, energy, and cost concerns across the entire water system. It has the ability to conduct high quality materials research up to large scale piloting at desalination and wastewater treatment facilities. We're working in three major themes, water desalination, water treatment, nutrient recovery, and energy recovery. All together, we're improving wastewater treatment in a very sustainable way and reduce the impact of climate change. Anything developed here can be applied anywhere around the world. The technologies we're working on will, in the future, allow for a better, more cost-effective, and more efficient wastewater treatment, even in remote places. We study everything from the deepest oceans to the oldest rocks. What we're really interested in is how those different things are all connected to each other. Before we had our uh, combined department here at UNC, we had, we had separate departments, and we didn't always interact as much as we could have. And we were really missing opportunities to study things between the continents and the ocean. I study natural disasters and the way that they impact communities um, and the ways in which the environment and human decisions are changing over time to exacerbate disaster impacts. My lab is specifically investigating how bacteria um, use unique molecular weapons to kill each other as they compete for a limited uh, space and resources. We want to be the place in North Carolina and really beyond that you come if you want to understand these interdisciplinary connections between continental processes and oceanic processes. Driver is organized around five work packages hydrology, biodiversity, biogeochemistry, socioeconomy, and adaptive management. Altogether, we will translate the effect of climate change onto the functional integrity of drying river networks. We managed to model flow intermittents across six different drying river networks using spatially distributed hydrological models. The idea is to provide stream flow intermittence data um, all over Europe. This data can then be used for quantification of current and future impacts of climate change and the impacts on biodiversity or ecosystem functions and services. Driver is working on providing new techniques, new tools, new nature-based solutions to be adapted to temporary rivers for water managers in order to preserve ecosystems in our rivers and also to preserve water users for human activity. We study the dynamics of natural fluid motions. That includes the atmospheric, oceanic, inland waters, as well as engineered flows, uh, which are, for example, uh, urban flows, as well as engineering uh, industrial flows. Well, we don't like to reinvent the wheel. We will try to get as close as we can with a commercial piece of equipment and then we will build on it to get the data that we need. We really identify what are the current interests to the society. Then we select a few of them which we can handle and then we design programs. Over the last seven years, there's not a lot of places uh, the equipment that we build and develop and, and maintain down here hasn't been. It's been in three different oceans, uh, tops of mountains in, in Europe and America, and on both different coasts. The Greenland ice sheet is really of particular importance. If you melt tomorrow, seas will be seven meters higher, which is enormous. Um, we are now dealing with centimeters, and it's already a problem. If a small part of Greenland melts, it's really impactful. So for example, 10% of the Greenland ice sheet is 70 centimeters, which is more than two feet. The Green Drill mission overall is drilling through kilometers of ice 
retrieving bedrock samples. And these bedrock samples contain the information about when was the ice sheet the last time smaller. It will tell us this particular spot, how vulnerable is this element to ongoing and future warming. We can't just focus on problems. We really need to get to that next level and deal with solutions. And I think Green Drill is the answer for that. As this Center for Satellite Applications and Research is charged with performing calibration and validation of all of NOAA's satellite sensors that launch to space and operate on a 24-7 basis. The collaboration with NOAA is really focused around improving the use of satellite observations. It's a research effort to use machine learning to see how well we can improve the way that we use satellite data to help weather forecasts. This collaboration merged basically our physical science expertise in NOAA with the AI expertise of Google. We are providing the seeds for a new system that will be more efficient, that will be inclusive of a lot more satellite data and a lot more environmental data, and therefore would provide better and more comprehensive understanding of the environment. Geophysical sciences are really uh, at an incredibly exciting time uh, in history because uh, we do have these uh, increasing capabilities in uh, space uh, observation, remote sensing, and uh, Science Systems and Applications Incorporated uh, is a 45-year-old company that has operating in the field of geophysics uh, uh, without interruption. SSCI scientists and engineers support uh, a lot of missions uh, from ISA2 to, uh, they work in geodesy and in a mesoscale, in climate and radiation, and also, of course, data simulation and modeling. Most uh, recent is uh, the contribution to uh, emission Dragonfly. Dragonfly is really trying to answer some of these really important questions that we have as humans. You know, are we alone in the universe? And also, how alone are we? You know, what, what we learn at Dragonfly might uh, change the way we ask that question. There is a tremendous amount of potential for cross-fertilization. We are expanding our knowledge and our understanding of the universe in which we live. We had an anniversary on the 15th of November where the world's population passed 8 billion people. And the challenge we face is how to feed 8 billion people and a growing number of people on the planet sustainably in a way that is, is healthy for the environment and healthy for human beings. The Agroecosystem Sustainability Center is a new University of Illinois initiative targeted at developing the most advanced sensing, modeling, and quantification tools to better understand holistic agriculture outcomes, including productivity as well as the sustainability metrics. Not only we are generating the most advanced science and technology to address this problem, but we also hope to deliver these science and solutions to the hand of stakeholders, including farmers, policy makers, and industry people, such that we can collectively build solutions together. The University of Iowa has been, you know, in the business of space physics research for as long as that has existed. We're working on a mission called Tracers, which looks to understand how energy, mass, and momentum coming from the sun connect into near-Earth space. And my part of that is an instrument called MAGIC, which will make very precise measurements of the magnetic field, which is basically steering and controlling that connection. Tracers is a NASA SMEX mission, or Small Explorer mission. It's a two satellite mission, and they're going to a, a region of the Earth called the cusp. In that region, a process that we know about called magnetic reconnection shoots a burst of particles that come down along the Earth's magnetic field. The main question that we're really interested in is this, is reconnection purely a, a time-varying phenomena? If it's just spatial, if I fly through with a second satellite, everything should be exactly in the same place. At Tulane and, and at Bywater, we have three research programs. One is designing our future by water. The second is sharing our future by water. And the third is growing our future by water. 
So designing our future by water is taking science and engineering and mixing them together to understand how we design natural and, and built infrastructure in order to improve our climate adaptation, in particular in response to water-related disasters. Sharing Our Future by Water is focused on water equity, and it involves uh, access to clean water and sanitation, but also, especially here in the city of New Orleans, access to safe spaces from hurricane storms and floods. The third is growing our future by water, and this is where we bring communities into the research uh, portfolio. So I like to think of this as um, a place where we can study problems like climate change and health, and also how we can source those sorts of needs from local communities. The Bywater Institute is fundamentally focused on bringing people together to come up with pragmatic solutions to the environmental challenges of our time. This project addresses precise regional forecasting, bio-intelligent, and rapid harness of national scale meteorological big data to provide precise weather model parameter predictions with the final temporal resolutions called prefer. For AI, you need to understand um, you have to have the, the state parameters. Once you have that for 10 years, you can then go ahead and train the models and they will project in the future. We can pinpoint when those storms are going to form and where we can warn people. In terms of, of, of weather forecasting, we are looking at a brand new world. The American Geophysical Union is active in so many different areas of science. Here with more now on how the AGU is helping science lead the future is AGU board member Lisa Gromlick. I am very excited about AGU's theme for this year's fall meeting, Science Leads the Future. And I'd actually like to up that a bit and say that Earth and space sciences play a particularly important role among all the sciences in thinking about what the future will be for us as humans and for a habitable planet. AGU, as the world's largest association of earth and space sciences, is called to be in a leadership role right now with respect to where science and society meet. Sometimes that's in ethical areas, one that comes to mind and that's very much in our area of work right now is thinking about climate intervention as we realize that CO2 levels are rising to dangerous levels and some of our efforts at mitigation are only going so far to, to stall that, that dangerous rise. We're looking at climate intervention strategies. Those are being talked about, solar radiation modification, storage of carbon deep in the oceans. And it occurred to the AGU leadership that there was no ethical framework for evaluating what kind of research should be done in this area, let alone what deployment might look like. Now, it's important, AGU as an organization is not taking a position for or against climate change intervention or advocating for one specific method or another, we are recognizing that this needs to be a conversation that is held by scientists, by policymakers, by people that are experts on governance, that are voices of indigenous peoples and people typically excluded from science are in the table, around the table as well. And we are bringing those people together to develop an ethical framework that will allow us to evaluate what are the best options for moving forward. Open science allows us to share science across disciplinary boundaries and across geographic boundaries. And we're committed to what are considered the gold standard principles of ocean science. And they have this great acronym called FAIR. And that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so technology is rapidly transforming our disciplines and allowing us 24-7 data sharing, but that 
that's only if you actually have true access to those data. So we are working to increase the capacity to access data for everyone. We are a global organization and this is a global priority. In addition, another way we're putting our money where our mouth is, is we're literally changing our publication model so that we, our publications can be accessed. Right now, nine of our 23 journals are fully open access. Half of our papers are open access at publication. And I'm very, very proud that one of our flagships, Geophysical Research Letters, is going to be fully open access in January 23. Another way AGU is leading in solution science is by our work in what is called community science. And this is a, a recognition that while science and technology is absolutely critical to solving problems, figuring out what problems need to be solved is both a scientific question and something that is deeply embedded by the lives and the livelihoods of the people who are most affected by the kind of challenges we currently face. So in community science, we work as scientists closely, literally sort of hand in hand with community members to define a scientific question that is both technical as well as how it actually impacts their lives and livelihoods, the health of their community, the welfare of their children, how they actually fare economically, all of those things. It's a different way of doing science. As a scientist myself, it means that we approach this work with much greater humility and, and we focus on listening to what the problems are and co-creating solutions. We're so dedicated to this that we've actually started a whole new journal about community science that's coupled with a portable a portal where you can share best practices, share data, and we can all come up together around this initiative. We are taking a variety of steps to ensure that everything that we do has an eye to increasing diversity and true inclusion, a true welcoming environment. And functional way in which inclusion occurs in our research and in our engagement. That does it now for this first look at AGU TV. We will have much more coming up in the week ahead. Laura Krantz will be joining you on site in Chicago for the full AGU TV broadcast as we continue to bring you specially curated content from the AGU 2022 fall meeting.